Kouyo. BCT. Le président. Veuillez vous asseoir. The court is now back in session. Reprise de l'audience. The floor is now given to the co-prosecutors and the lead co-lawyers to Nous respond to the parole. second question. À l'accusation et aux parties civiles pour. Euh, as follows, the trial chamber's servants' order and related decisions were expressly motivated by a concern to preserve its ability to render any timely verdict in S002. As a general matter, would you prefer the chamber to attempt to try a broader array of charges and factual allegations de chef in case 002 at the risk of no verdict being ultimately obtained, en fin compte, aucun or do you consider it preferable to proceed instead in relation to a more limited array of charges and factual allegations, thereby increasing the likelihood that a verdict can be rendered? That is the question. The floor is now given to the co-prosecutors. Thank you, Your Honours. Um, we have some level of repetition, I'm afraid, because these questions are so interlinked. Um, certainly, uh, our position has been from the very start of this issue back in 2011 uh, that we would wish for this case to proceed upon the basis of a more limited uh, scope of charges for the reasons referred to in the first question. Our dispute with the Chamber is simply uh, whether or not the particular charges selected in the severance order, the crime sites that were selected, are representative of the indictment of the closing order as a whole. And we say uh, that those matters that you selected are not representative. And indeed, again, to repeat myself, if you go to the Supreme Court Chamber's decision, they agree with us. And they say that you have to address that issue in your new severance order. So, yes, we do agree that this case should proceed on a more limited array of charges and factual allegations because we believe that that will increase the likelihood of a verdict. But we say that those matters that you select for the new severance order should have this reasonable representativeness quality. And I think you, you, you will guess that I am in favour of the second option that the Supreme Court Chamber gave you, which is the option that there will only be one trial, and thus you must ensure that that trial, again to repeat myself, is reasonably representative of the case as a whole. One final comment, and then I've completed what I have to say on this. I noticed, I heard earlier my, my colleague, uh, the international lead co-lawyer for the civil parties, say that this is all very late. Uh, and I understand her frustration. It is very late in the day that this decision comes down. But it is a decision of the Supreme Court Chamber. And whether it's late or not, we, this court, the parties have to follow the direction that is given in that decision. And also, I would emphasize to you, even though we follow this, these questions, it's absolutely imperative that the parties are all properly heard. That's what the Supreme Court Chamber stated. We have Chambre to be Supreme heard on these issues because it goes to the heart of this case. And these issues have to be resolved very, very quickly. We all know that, but we must all be properly heard. Thank you. Merci. 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 Merci.
le would not pour like to have one trial de covering civil. all the facts in the case zero zero two. Voir un procès plutôt. La Chambre préférerait que la Chambre ne retienne pas l'ensemble de l'acte d'accusation pour le procès. Les parties civiles souhaitent voir un procès avec verdict. In the spirit of the servants of the case, it is a relief for the civil parties to see a shorter trial where a verdict could be possible. À l'idée qu'un procès dont la portée serait plus courte permettrait de rendre effectivement de mener effectivement un verdict. Because the trial should be proportionate to the actual situation of the health of the accused as well as the financial constraint faced by the court. My international colleague would like to add to what I have just stated, the President. Allez-y, Maître. Oui, je rassure la Chambre, je n'aurai pas d'observations complémentaires sur chaque question. Je voudrais déjà faire une clarification. La décision de la Cour suprême n'arrive pas trop tard en ce qu'elle soulève à nouveau des questions auxquelles il n'était pas répondu. C'est une très bonne chose pour nous que la Cour suprême ait reposé ces questions. Je disais simplement que la décision de la Cour suprême arrive trop tard en ce qu'elle annule totalement la disjonction, ce qui n'est pas la même chose. Sur cette deuxième question maintenant qui est posée par la Chambre, je crois, je voudrais ajouter juste quelques réflexions parce que je crois que c'est une question à laquelle on ne peut pas répondre oui ou non, blanc ou noir. Je crois euh, que ce n'est pas une simple alternative. Il n'y a pas d'un côté un jugement dans un délai raisonnable et de l'autre un large champ de faits jugés avec le risque de ne pas avoir de jugement. Ce n'est pas l'un ou l'autre. C'est nécessairement un équilibre qu'il faut trouver et un équilibre qui a été modifié au fur et à mesure du temps et des débats. Et je voudrais livrer deux réflexions à la Chambre très rapidement à ce sujet qui me paraissent nécessaires pour décider. La première réflexion, c'est que si la représentativité est au départ dans le choix des faits, que l'on choisit d'évoquer, cette représentativité est ensuite dans la façon dont on va traiter ces faits pendant les débats. Je m'explique, à partir du moment où la Chambre a disjoint et limité le premier dossier au transfert forcé 1 et 2, il nous est revenu de poser des questions, de présenter des documents et d'intervenir en cherchant les causes et les effets de ces transferts, en les reliant à d'autres événements, dans le but de donner un sens à ce procès et d'en faire autant que possible un procès représentatif et rendu dans un délai raisonnable. Nous ne sommes donc pas obligés d'inclure tous les faits pour qu'un procès soit représentatif. Il suffit d'inclure simplement quelques faits et nous partageons totalement la position des procureurs. Nous n'étions pas contre la disjonction, nous étions contre la disjonction telle qu'elle a été faite. La deuxième réflexion que je voudrais faire et qui me paraît importante, notamment par respect pour les partis civils, c'est que nous avons plusieurs fois souligné que pour nous, un procès ne se résume pas à une simple décision. Il faut que cette décision s'appuie sur des débats qui viennent la justifier et lui donner son sens. Et dans un procès comme celui-ci, dont l'achèvement dépend de tant de facteurs très aléatoires, nous ne devrions pas attacher une beaucoup plus grande importance à la décision finale qu'au débat qui y conduisent. Ces débats sont les sujets et les sujets qui sont traités pendant ces débats sont tout aussi essentiels que la décision finale. Et même si notre objectif, c'est évidemment comme dans tout procès, d'obtenir, d'aboutir à une décision, tout ce qui se passe avant, au fil des audiences, jour après jour, c'est quelque chose de positif dans l'œuvre de justice que nous poursuivons. Donc je voulais vous faire part de ces deux réflexions parce que la réponse à cette question numéro 2, la réponse qu'apportera la Chambre, 
et dans un équilibre à trouver entre le délai raisonnable et le caractère représentatif du procès. Le président. Merci. The floor is now once again given to the co à présent, la parole the est à nouveau à l'accusation et aux co-avocats principaux. Mais avant cela, la parole est donnée à la juge Fentz. I just wanted to highlight a factor relevant in this balancing exercise. I'm sure it's clear to the parties, so this is basically aimed at the public who should understand what we are doing here. We are talking about the likelihood of a verdict. A verdict needs to be written. The writing of a verdict can only start once evidentiary proceedings are finished. That means there will not be a verdict on the day after the closing speeches. Now, I will not speculate on the time needed for writing this verdict, but perhaps we can get some idea on the time possibly needed when we look at case one. This was a case against one accused, dealing with basically one crime site. Dossier portant essentiellement sur un site de crime. After the closing speeches, Après les it took eight months finales, for the il a fallu trial chamber to get the verdict out. À la chambre pour prononcer son verdict. Proceedings before the Supreme Court took another roughly one and a half years. Suprême a pris environ un so an if we demi add this, Donc, si fait le calcul, we arrive at, um, arrive, if I calculate it si correctly, Two years and three months à deux ans et trois to mois achieve a final verdict after the closing speeches. Now, this case is a case against three accused, with arguably more evidentiary and legal challenges. De the reason I'm mentioning it here juridique. is, first of all, transparency for the si public, ces questions, c par souci de and secondly, public, but I'm sure this has happened already, aussi, to ensure that the parties pour take this factor into consideration en du compte, même si in, future, uh, in further arguments. Thank you. Le font déjà. Bah, Orkun. President, le président. Merci. I'd like to give the floor, the floor first, first to the co-prosecutors and then the lead co-lawyers to respond to the third question, and the third question is the following. At the, question. at the time of the SCC decision, the Charles Chamber was sneering the conclusion of the decision of the Court Supreme Court. It estimates that relatively few bodies of the courtroom days in the presence of all three accused were required in order to conclude the hearing of evidence in the first trial. Afin de clore les audiences the of the consacrées à l'examen de la preuve dans le cadre de ce premier procès. Depuis que les procureurs ont interjeté appel et d'autre part, comme l'ont anticipé les experts médicaux surveillant régulièrement l'état de santé de tous les accusés, la Chambre a constaté que le déroulement de la procédure prenait de plus en plus de retard et qu'il était difficile d'avoir la présence de trois accusés à tout moment donnée en raison de leur fragile état de santé. In the light of these changed circumstances and difficulties of implementing the alternative course, do you still oppose the trial chamber's definition of the scope of its first trial as expressed in the severance order? dans l'ordonnance de disjonction et les decisions. décisions s'y rapportant Thank you, Your Honour. Just to um, respond to Monsieur Judge Fenn's 
J'aimerais um, répondre à la juge Fenton. Bien sûr, nous savons combien de temps il faut pour rédiger un jugement. Mais, en quelque sorte, vous avez donné plus de force à l'argument militant pour une représentation militante. Vous avez dit que 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 vous avez
de mettre tous ces éléments en balance. Monsieur le Président, merci. Once again, the floor will à nouveau, be given la parole to va être donnée aux coprocureurs, co puis aux avocats principaux pour répondre à la quatrième question the question is the dont je donne lecture à présent. If you maintain your si vous maintenez votre demande the scope visant à élargir la portée de tous les procès dans le dossier numéro 002, Is this request Cette limited to the addition of factual allegations related to S21 and District 12, et au district 12 or ou bien do you consider the SEC's direction to ensure reasonable de de representativity de to require a still broader range of factual allegations et des à examiner and charges Inclusion of le fait d'inclure le centre de sécurité S21 et le district 12 would encompass ne only a limited geographical area, encapsulate only a minor part of the overall optimization in case 002 and compel the chamber to rehear allegations in relation to the only crime site to have been adjudicated before the ECCC to date. The trial chamber limited case 002-01 principally to force movement on grounds that the phenomenon avait concerné pratiquement toutes les personnes vivant au Cambodge pendant le régime du Cambodge démocratique. So, please, make your comments Veuillez faire part de vos observations par rapport aux critères de représentativité dégagé of de la décision de la Chambre de proceed. la Cour suprême. Thank you, um, Mr. Kelly. Your Merci. Honours, I have quite substantial submissions to make to you on this issue because I think à ce it's sujet. at the heart uh, of all of this debate. Uh, but I would just try and answer some of these questions at the beginning de of the questions. question. Um, where I don't actually cover them in my submissions. One particular point I want to address is this issue you raise of rehearing allegations in relation to the only crime site to have been adjudicated before the ECCC to date. And here, and let me labour this for the purposes of the public. We're talking about S21 because case 001 dealt with S21 and with DOIC. But as far as the proposition that you make that because the evidence relating to that crime site has been heard somehow precludes it being part of the second case, um, I disagree with that position if that's what's being suggested. The Supreme Court chamber makes it very clear that this court is a sui generis, internationalized court, applying international law as well as Cambodian domestic law. And if you look to the guidance of those other courts, of the Yugoslav Tribunal, of the Rwanda Tribunal, you will find that in a number of cases, the same crimes were addressed, but in respect of different individuals being tried for the same crimes. An example comes to mind of a case, actually, that Mr. Carnivas and I were both involved in, which were the events in Srebrenica in July of 1995. In Bosnia, there were multiple trials at the Yugoslav Tribunal concerning events in Srebrenica of different accused. And here, in this instance, we are speaking of people who are more superior to the individual who has been tried and convicted and thus arguably more responsible for what actually took place at S21. So I want to essentially park 
that particular Donc, point on one side because I don't believe it is something that should be relevant for your consideration and I think there are other very compelling reasons why you should include S21 within this S21 case. Let me now address you on this issue of representativeness. Now, as I've said, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to avoid repeating myself, but unfortunately this does lend itself to a certain degree of repetition. We seek to have included in this case Tulpul Trey and S21. As far as Tulpul Trey is concerned, we agree with the reasons that you set out in paragraph 3 of your memorandum of the 8th of October of 2012, that's E1635, its connection with the force transfer, so we agree with that. Now, moving on to this principle of reasonable representativeness when severing, we submit that in the context of an indictment at the ECCC, this is a principle that should be applied, and indeed the Supreme Court Chamber directed you to apply it. Now, Rule 89 Ter of our own internal rules for this court allows for severance when the interests of justice require it. But that rule does not elaborate on what factors you should actually take into account when you are engaged in the severance process. In such a situation, we submit, in accordance with the agreement and the statute, that you are required to look to Les international law to guide you. As I've said, the Supreme Court Comme Chamber dit, affirmed that approach. They recognized that the severance process requires that the severed indictment be reasonably representative of the full indictment, particularly where there is concern about having more than one case. They held that that approach is directed by common sense par la suite. Cela of meaningful justice par le and conforms bon sens, with comparative justice comparable international legal standards. And in reference to those international standards, you will sujet, find uh, that the Supreme Court Chamber held at paragraph 42 paragraph and I believe paragraph 38 of the Supreme Court Chamber decision that international standards were reflected in Rule 73 bis D of the ICTY Rules of Procedure and Evidence. Now, I'm not going to read that rule out to save time. Um, I'm sure your legal officers can obtain a copy of it for you. But in summary, what that rule says, Yugoslav Tribunal, is that severance requires that any reduction of counts or crime sites or incidents must be done in a way that what is left in the indictment and in the closing order in our case is reasonably representative of the full indictment. Now that rule includes certain factors which should be considered by you in order to ensure that the indictment is reasonably representative. Now there are six factors mentioned in that rule, and there are further two factors that have arisen because of case law at the Yugoslav Tribunal, an additional two factors, which I believe I will, I will also assist you, and I'll make very brief submissions on them. Now, the first factor that you have to consider are the actual crimes charged in the indictment. What are the crimes charged in the indictment? Secondly, what is the classification of those crimes? Thirdly, the nature of those crimes. Now, you can see that those three issues are actually very much linked together. I'll try and unpack them, but they are really, I think, issues that you need to consider together. Now, the fourth issue relates to the places where the crimes are alleged to have been committed. The fifth issue is the scale of the crimes. The sixth is the victims of the crimes. And then a further 
issues which, as I say, are je dit, incorporated into this matrix by reason of case law, and that's the time period de... over which the crimes took place. Volume. And then the last point, which I think is Des a very important one in this case, is the fundamental nature or theme of the case. Let's look at the first dossier. point, Prenons the crimes point, that have been charged in the closing order. Severance requires that the crimes retained are reasonably representative of the original indictment. Now, the crimes in the severed indictment must be of the same severity and variety as those in the closing order as a whole. And again, I emphasize what I said a moment ago. I believe that you should balance against all of these factors the age and health of the accused. In applying this test, I think you have to do that. That is why we have come up with the formulation that we are going to offer you, because we accept that that is something that you do need to weigh against these factors. Now, the addition of S21 to the annulled severance order, to a new severance order, will significantly increase the representativeness of the indictment in terms of crimes charged. The charges associated with S21 are murder, extermination, enslavement, imprisonment, torture, political persecution, persecution politique, racial persecution, persecution racial, and other inhumane acts through attacks against human dignity. Also, recall your honours that S21 addresses a number of grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions that we currently don't have in, in, in the case as it stood prior to the appeal's decision. Willful killing is a grave breach, torture as a grave Torture, breach, inhumane treatment traitement inhumain, as a grave breach, voilà de willfully causing great suffering le fait de as a grave, grave breach, willfully depriving a prisoner of war to a fair trial, grave breach, unlawful deportation of civilians, grave breach, unlawful confinement of civilians, grave breach. So the inclusion of S21 would lead Retenir to the incorporation into this case of four additional charges of crimes against humanity, enslavement, imprisonment, torture, torture, and other inhumane acts through attacks on human dignity, and four unique grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, willfully causing great suffering, willfully depriving a prisoner of war to a fair trial, unlawful deportation of civilians, and unlawful confinement of the civilian. Now, it's even arguable that actually, although willful killing as a grave breach addresses murder as a crime against humanity, that there are unique elements within the great breaches provisions which actually do make it a separate crime. I don't want to split hairs over this, but certainly you can see that if you incorporate S21, you incorporate a whole array of additional charges providing a greater scope and a much more reasonable representation of the indictment as a whole. Let me look very quickly at classification of crimes, the second factor which this test would offer you to consider in coming to a new severance order. Severance requires that the classification of the crimes charged are reasonably representative of the original indictment. Now, as you know, in the original closing order, those crimes belong to classes. Genocide, arguably, a very, very serious crime against humanity, but nevertheless a separate provision. Crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, and also national crimes under the Cambodian Code of Criminal Procedure. Now, at the moment, we are addressing a single group of crimes, crimes against humanity, including S21, would incorporate si grave breaches on of the Geneva Conventions. You wouldn't be addressing all of the crimes, all of the different classifications of crimes crime in the closing order, but you would be addressing substantially more than you are now. Now, the third factor, factor, the nature of the crimes, you must address this too. 
Severance requires that the nature of the crimes charged are reasonably representative of the original indictment. Again, I know this is linked to the first two factors, but I'm giving you the test as you'll find it in the law. Now, the nature of the crimes charged relates to the similarities and differences in the core elements of each crime within a similar class. So, for example, within the category of crimes against humanity, murder and extermination would be similar crimes with similar core elements because they both, of course, involve unlawful killing. However, murder and extermination would be different to imprisonment that we don't have or we didn't have in the annulled old severance order. As so I've said a moment ago, the grave breaches provisions again contain unique elements, one of which is including proof of international armed conflict. So the addition of S21 to the annulled severance order will significantly increase the representativeness of the nature of the crimes contained in the closing order. We will be adding to the original severance order crimes of enslavement, torture, including rape, imprisonment and other inhumane acts, willful killing, grave breach, torture, grave breach, inhum inhumane treatment, grave breach, willfully causing great suffering. I won't repeat myself, I've said this already, but you can see that within these other crimes there are unique elements that are not present in the crimes that are currently being addressed by the Chamber. Fourthly, um, I need to address you on places where crimes were committed. Severance requires that the places where the crimes were committed are reasonably representative of the original indictment. That means that the crimes in the severed case must be geographically reflective of the crimes in the original indictment. So, for example, where crimes occur in the original indictment across a variety of locations within a country, the severed indictment should try as far as possible to reflect that. Conversely, where crimes occur in one place, it would be appropriate to sever the case to exclude crimes outside that one localised place. Now, the addition of S21 to this case would actually significantly increase the representativeness of the places where crimes were committed in the indictment. Now, I know from your memorandum you, you disagree with that proposition because you say, well, S21 actually was a very limited locus. Now, although S21 was located in one geographical area, it in fact is more reasonably representative of the commission of crimes throughout Cambodia than any other criminal event in the indictment. Why is that? Well, because victims who were tortured and executed within S21 were brought in from all over Cambodia, from every zone. North, South, North, East and West. Est et and if you read the allegations si in the closing order, you will find that it actually supports this proposition. I'm not going to go through all of it, but let me just give you a few examples. If you go to paragraph 431 of the closing order, it states the CP cadres and members of the RAK who were arrested came from all zones and autonomous sectors of Cambodia. Next, paragraph 434. For the arrest and transfer of CPK cadres and RAK members from autonomous regions or zones, two methods were used. In some cases, S21 personnel would go to the zones and make arrests or collect prisoners arrested by the, the zone units and then return to Phnom Penh. In other cases, CPK cadres and RAK members were summoned to Phnom Penh by Office 870 and in particular by Nguyen Chia officially for a meeting and they dis disappeared, never to be seen again. Paragraph 437 of the closing order, the arrest of Vietnamese civilians and soldiers generally took place 
in the main conflict zone. So you can see that, in fact, contrary to what you say in your, your memorandum, suggesting that it's very, very limited in geographical scope, in fact, S21 is wide in geographical scope, and it satisfies uh, that particular part of the test. The fifth factor that you've got to consider which I've mentioned already, is the scale évoqué, of crimes. Any severance requires that the scale of crimes charged are reasonably representative of the original closing order. This means that crimes in the severed indictment need to reflect the full extent of the, original, of the crimes in the original indictment or closing order. Now, it's our submission that the addition of S21 in the new severance order will significantly increase the representativeness of the scale of crimes contained in the indictment. What is this case about? This case is principally about the untimely death or murder of one point between 1.7 and 2.2 million people who perished between 1975 and 1979. S21 better represents the magnitude and severity of the crimes in this case, probably more than any other crime within the closing order. Just a couple of factors for you to consider here. Um, if you look at the closing order, paragraph 422, S21 was the most important security centre in democratic Kampuchea. It was considered to be an organ of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. Its management reported to the highest echelons of the party. It conducted activities on a national scale and senior level cadres and important prisoners were held there. We know from the first case Nous that at least 12,272 people perished in S21. A very, very significant number of people and reflective of the mass killings that went on in this country. The sixth issue that you need to consider are the victims of crimes. La deuxième question que vous devez, dont vous this devez compte, ce sont les particular factor requires that any new La case, plutôt, ce any severed victimes. case, is reasonably representative of the original in indictment in terms of victims, groupings of victims, particular ethnic groups. Respect les intérêts des victimes et des groupes de victimes, notamment des Now, groupes ethniques. if you look at the original closing order, <laughs> The entire population of Cambodia is considered as victims of the crimes charged. Now, in relation to the policy of implementing and defending the CPK socialist revolution through the re-education of bad elements and the killing of enemies both inside and outside the party ranks by whatever means necessary, the victims were from two groups. Les victimes de ces crimes Internal étaient dans deux groupes, enemies les groupes d'ennemis internes et les ennemis considérés comme externes. Now, external enemies les included de l'extérieur comprenaient secondly, the Vietnamese, les Chams, puis les Vietnamiens, Buddhists, les Bouddhistes, former officials of the Khmer les Republic, anciens fonctionnaires de la Khmer, civil servants et former military personnel les in their families. Et les membres Internal party enemies included members les of the CPK and the RAK. Now, if you look at the annulled severance order, the victims groups with regard to the first population related exclusively to external party enemies, so city dwellers, new people, and former civil servants. Similarly, if you look at the second population movement, the groups transferred were largely external to the party in the RAK. These groups included, again, former city dwellers, former civil servants, Cham, Khmer Krom, and Chinese. Now, with regard to Tolpol Tre, the victim groups were external party enemies, such as former Khmer public officials and soldiers, as well as people with bad biographies and viewed to be undisciplined in the cooperatives. In contrast, 
If you look at S21, Lorsque the majority cela, of the victims were in internal party members of CPK leadership. The, this internal enemy group, I think, can be broken down into subgroups, the most significant of which are members of the Revolutionary Army of Capuchia, with the next most significant being members of the CPK cadre. In both of these groups, the positions of these victims range from the very highest to the lowest within the CPK. More specifically, there were cadres from the ministries for which these accused were principally responsible. For example, 209 victims were from Office 870 and S71, and at least 113 were from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and 482 from the Ministry of Commerce. These victims came from across the entire country and the influx and type of prisons directly related to the purges conducted around the country. Other groups which were not CPK cadre or RAK military were former soldiers and officials of the Khmer Republic, former members of the National United Front of Kampuchea, members of the educated classes, des des teachers, professors, des des professors des students, des doctors, des médecins, lawyers, avocats, and engineers. Of the non-Cambodian victim groups of S21, the Vietnamese were in the largest, les les le groupe, le with also le plus people from Thailand, Laos, Thailand, India, Laos and Western countries, et United et States, States, Australia, and the United Australia, Kingdom. Le so it's absolutely apparent that if you include S21, you increase the victim groups that will be represented, the people that will find justice. They've gone, but justice can still be done for a wider group of victims. Let me talk about the last two factors that you need to consider. First of all, the time period of the crimes. Now, although this is a factor that's not explicitly recognized under ICTY Rule 73 bis D, case law at the tribunals has emerged that severance should ensure that the time period of the crimes charged are reasonably representative of the original indictment. For example, a severed indictment should be reasonably representative of the months or years over which the crimes took place. And second, a severed case should try and reflect, as far as possible, any key phases in the commission of those crimes. And the case which supports that proposition um, is the prosecutor and Stanisic and Simatovic, S-T-A-N-I-S-I-C, Simatovic, S-I-M-A-T-O-V-I-C, case IT-0369-PT, pt decision pursuant to 73-BIS-D of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, and I'll give the, the dates of that decision. Les dates de cette décision. Uh, the date of that decision for the purposes of reference is the 4th of February 2008. Paragraph 23 is the relevant part of that judgment. Now, the addition of S21 to this case will significantly increase the representativeness of the time period. In contrast to the forced transfer, which, as the trial chamber has pointed out, occurred right at the beginning of the chronology of this terrible story, it's very, very limited. It's a limited period of time. Now, S21 became operational in October of 1975 and remained in operation until the 7th of January 1979. So you would in effect be covering the entire time period of the closing order by incorporating S21 into the case. Now the last issue uh, to consider, again this was also um, introduced by case law uh, from the ad hoc tribunals, 
Um, the again, it's not a fact that's explicitly recognized within 73 bis d, but chambers have incorporated this particular factor in the matrix that they use to decide on how a case should be severed. And they say that severance should reasonably represent the fundamental nature or theme of the case. Uh, you can find uh, the law on this in the Stanisic and Somata decision, which I mentioned, uh, paragraphs 8 and 9, um, essentially supporting this part of the test. The addition, Your Honours, of S21 really reflects the heart of this case. If you look at the common purpose of the joint criminal enterprise, it states that the common purpose was to implement rapid socialist revolution in Cambodia through a great leap forward and defend the party against internal and external enemies by whatever means necessary. Now, that common purpose is said to have come into effect on the 17th of April of 1975 and continued until the 6th of January of 1979. Now, as things stood in the now annulled severance order, we were addressing principally the forced movement of the population. Only one of five criminal policies identified as being part of the joint criminal enterprise in the closing order at paragraph 157. By including S21, you are not only covering the entire period of the joint criminal enterprise, but you will also be addressing three of the five criminal policies expressed in the joint criminal enterprise within the closing order. In conclusion on this issue of representativeness, this case, the heart of this case, although there were multiple types of crimes that were committed during this period of time, but the heart of this case is about arrests, torture and murder at security centres. The accused have been charged in respect of 11 security centres. S21 is one of those security centres directly connected to the Standing Committee. Directly connected to the Standing Committee. An important factor bearing in mind the accused that we are dealing with. So, in conclusion, Your Honours, and let me just check that I've actually answered all of your questions. Um, I would emphasise that contrary to what you say here, in fact, the inclusion of S21, we're not now asking for District 12 because we have gone through this balancing act of looking at the health and fitness of the accused, and we're not now pursuing that any longer. But we do believe that S21, in fact, represents a very large proportion of the types of victims who suffered in this country. And we do believe that it encompasses, for the reasons I won't repeat, a significant geographical area, because victims came from all over Cambodia. And I think I've covered in some depth this concept of representativity, uh, which the Supreme Court Chamber directed your minds to address when you make your next decision. So thank you, Your Honours. I don't have any further decision. I would like to thank attention and I don't have anything to add on this point. The President, thank you. The President. Next. I hand over to the legal lawyers for the civil party to respond to this question. Counsel Pekong, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, actually, I do not have much uh, thing to add. We simply concur with uh, the international co-prosecutor concerning a schedule that is uh, quite comprehensive, and I think that the point should be well taken. As a matter of fact, the civil parties, lawyers representing the civil parties who have endured uh, a lot of uh, atrocities, 
including the Cambodian national charm, Muslim charms, and Vietnamese minorities in Cambodia suffer from the atrocities and crimes committed during the period of three years, eight months, and 20 days. And on behalf of the civil parties, we do want uh, the trial chamber uh, to adjudicate on those uh, crimes allegedly committed during the period. However, taking into account uh, the, the actual circumstance, we uh, also understand uh, that uh, if the scope and magnitude of the case uh, is not manageable within an appropriate period of time, uh, we uh, would uh, ask the chamber to consider appropriate um, scale down of the scope. And as for uh, the uh, proposed inclusion of uh, crime size in S21, I think uh, that it is very uh, appropriate. And, uh, of course, if you look at the uh, prisoners uh, who were detained and tortured at S21, uh, some of our living um, civil parties and uh, witnesses uh, are also uh, were also imprisoned in S21, and they are now also the civil parties to the proceedings, and they are demanding that their, uh, the, uh, the justice be brought to them. So I believe that uh, the scope of S21 is appropriate to be included. The president. The time is now appropriate for lunch adjournment. The chamber will adjourn now until 1.30 this afternoon. The court is now adjourned. Some